Hi, everyone, and welcome. Hope everybody's in a pretty good mood. I just looked at the forecast before going on air here. In the cities next Wednesday, the forecast is for 97 degrees. My lake ice turned black overnight, so I'm pretty happy. I hope everybody else is. I'm Brian Whittemore of Atasca Waters, and I'm pleased to host the second Atasca Waters Practical Water Wisdom Series. Thanks for taking the time out of this sunny day to attend the session. We really appreciate that you care about water quality. Atasca Waters is a local nonprofit that has been active in Atasca County since 2009. If you haven't done so, you can check out our many accomplishments on our website, atascawaters.org, in addition to accessing a treasure trove of clean water practices. But in brief, our goal has been to find grants to do research on local water quality and then to do educational events such as this to share that knowledge. We are very excited to offer our monthly Practical Water Wisdom, a virtual learning series. We have an outstanding lineup of speakers through 2022 and hope that you will gain new ideas and strategies for keeping your water healthy. We thank our partners big time for making these events possible. They include the Grand Rapids Area Community Foundation Fund, Minnesota Sea Grant, Atasca Soil and Water Conservation District, Atasca Coalition of Lake Associations, Rapids Radio, KAXE, KBXE Radio, and the Blandon Foundation. Hosting the question and answer section today will be Atasca Waters board member and manager of the Atasca County AIS program, Bill Granches. Now, just a few housekeeping notes for you. The format for the session will be this. Our speaker will discuss the science behind the topic and then give you some strategies and actions that you can use at your property and in the local environment. That will be followed by an opportunity for you to ask questions. And to ask questions, simply click on Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type a brief question into the dialog box. You can do that at any time during our speaker's presentation and Bill will read those questions to our speaker during the Q&A section. Similar questions may be combined and we may not get to all the questions if we run out of time. This program is being recorded and will be available for viewing online through our website at taskawaters.org. And finally, we really value your opinion and hope you will complete the evaluation form that will be sent to you by email after today's session. Okay, our speaker today is Dr. Nick Phelps. Dr. Phelps is the director of the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center. He is also associate professor in the Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology Department at the University of Minnesota. Nick studies emerging threats to our aquatic systems at the macro and microbial scales in the areas of fish health and AIS. He has earned degrees in aquatic biology from Bemidji State University, fisheries and aquaculture from the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff, and veterinary medicine from the University of Minnesota. It is a huge honor to welcome Dr. Phelps to our program today and to the monthly Atasca Waters Practical Water Wisdom Series. So take it away, Nick. All right, thank you very much, Brian, for the introduction and thank you all for joining me today. I'm excited to talk to you and give you a sense of the science behind the aquatic invasive species issues that we're working on and some things that you can do to be involved and help address these problems. So, well, next slide, please. We'll begin with what we imagine the world to be here and you know, many places in Atasca County, the, the good life still exists and aquatic invasive species aren't a problem. But there are lakes, um, next slide please, in Itasca County and around the world that are affected by invasive species. This is one of the biggest threats to the health and biodiversity of our environment and the way that we interact with it. Um, that can't be um, overstated. Sorry, can you go back please? Thanks. Um, just to be sure we're on the same page, um, there is a technical definition of a, an invasive species, and those are non-native species, so things that have been introduced by people 
that cause or may cause economic environmental harm or harm to human health and threaten our natural resources or the way that we use natural resources in the state. I wanna be sure we understand that um, not all invasive species are a problem in all places. They're not all lakes are good walleye lakes and not all lakes are good for zebra mussels. Nevertheless, the, there are a lot of lakes that are already impacted and many more that are at risk and deserves our attention to help address these problems. Next slide. So what do we do about it? Um, the problem has been getting worse and worse over the recent decades. And in 2012, the state of Minnesota, um, the legislature, the university, and many um, partners across the state came together and said enough is enough. We have to do something about this problem. Um, simply put, we can't solve today's problems with the same tools that existed when these species arrived and became an issue. We have to develop new tools to help solve these new problems. And that's where the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center um, came into being. Next slide. I'm going to skip the administrative part of the talk and get as quickly as I can into the cool science. But I want you to know that our mission statement simply put is to develop solutions to our AIS problems. We're here to develop new tools to fill key knowledge gaps and move things forward. We work across the state, although we're based here on the St. Paul campus of the University of Minnesota. Um, we're working all over the place on all sorts of different things. Next slide. If we zoom in here to part of Itasca County, um, you can go to this interactive map that's on our website um, and you can click on each one of these little dots and it will tell you what research project was happening on these lakes that you live on or care about. So you can sort of get that sense of what we're doing in your neck of the woods. Next slide. Just really quickly, we have a lot of people working on this problem right now. We have 32 research fellows. Those are PhD level scientists working on various things. And we have 19 graduate students. They're the um, creative energy behind the operation. They're um, absolutely spectacular. We have external advisory boards and a big emphasis, as you'll see later, on outreach, being sure that this science gets out into the real world in ways that it can make a difference. Next slide. So we've been, um, we've had to date over the last nine years or so, about 50 to 60 different projects. Some of these um, have been long-term efforts. Some are fairly small and focused. Um, way too much to talk about in the next 20 minutes. So I'm going to pick and choose here with some guidance from the planning committee on some species of local relevance and some topics that I think you might find interesting or care about. So there's going to be a lot that I don't talk about um, huge progress on common carp and non-native Phragmites, Eurasian water milfoil that I'm not even going to mention. And the things I do talk about are going to be summarized in a few bullet points. So it's quite humbling for the researchers to get their hard work distilled down into little chunks here. But um, if you're curious to learn more, I will save some time for Q&A and you can ask me anything you want, or you can check out our website here and we try to put all of this information out there in ways that are um, relatively easy to understand with videos and fact sheets and technical reports and published papers if that interests you too. So long story short, we've got a lot of stuff going on. I'm gonna just barely scratch the surface here in the next few slides. Next slide, please. I'm gonna begin with a species that is, um, you're all probably well aware of and perhaps unfortunately have seen in your favorite lakes and that's the zebra mussel. Um, this little mussel was introduced in the 80s. It came from the Caspian Sea region on ocean going ships that came into the Great Lakes. The zebra mussels were introduced and quickly became established throughout the basin. Then started jumping to inland lakes and have moved around um, largely through recreational boating traffic and other lake related equipment like docks and lifts and um, uh, rafts, things like that. Um, we've done a lot of work on zebra mussels. Prior to Maserk being here, we did not, the state of Minnesota didn't have a PhD scientist working dedicated on zebra mussels, and we have done a ton of work. Um, we understand how they move around better. We understand the impacts. We can 
um, find them more easily. We fill these knowledge gaps and been providing tools to managers to really make a difference out there in the field. Next slide. One of the things that we're particularly proud of is this tool called the AIS Explorer. And the web link is here. I'm not gonna go into a lot of details on this right now, but um, suffice it to say that we created a tool um, that essentially forecasts future invasion patterns. We understand how they spread around. We've used Bayesian um, simulation models to uh, forecast the future. Um, next slide. The first application that's on this dashboard is a tool for informing surveillance. Um, you can see here, these different colors indicate the likelihood that zebra mussels will be introduced and become established in any given lake in the state. This is a probability within eight years that zebra mussels are going to be there from 0% to 100%. I mean, you can zoom around on this. This is a totally interactive map and you can find your favorite lake and see what the probability is there. Next slide. And we've used some of the underlying uh, data in a different approach called decision optimization models. It's uh, pretty analogous to how an Amazon warehouse knows where to put the paper towels so that it's to your door as quickly as possible. The same type of approach on where to put watercraft inspectors to intercept the highest number of risky boats. And you can look at this at individual counties and it provides recommendations to managers that they can use with their own local knowledge and situations to make decisions to allocate resources most efficiently. Next slide. Now where this is going next, those tools have been out there for a couple of years now and um, a lot of counties are using them. Um, we're now building a new application for called intervention impact where managers can go in, um, input interventions that they want to apply to disrupt the current status quo. If they wanna put inspectors in one place and decon stations in another, um, that changes risk, right? So we wanna simulate that through these models and this dashboard is gonna be entirely user-defined information that will um, let managers know the change in risk over time and the cost of that intervention, really this cost benefit of management. And a tool like this doesn't exist and it's still fairly early, but these mock-ups here that I'm showing now um, is the first time that we're presenting this publicly. So um, hot off the press. Next slide. Now, what do you do if zebra mussels are established? I mean, that is all good for prevention and management, but once they're there, I, don't, I do not believe that we need to assume that they will always be there. That doesn't have to be the inevitable fate. Um, and there ought to be tools at our disposal to suppress populations um, over time. So we've scaled up research from the lab. You can see these little jars. Next slide. And next slide. So small mesoscosms in lakes to large areas within lakes. The largest ever treatment using uh, mollusca side was done in 2019 on Lake Minnetonka in partnership with the USGS. The problem or the question isn't how do we kill zebra mussels? We can and we can do it very well. Where the research is at at this point is how can we do that while minimizing the non-target impacts? The collateral damage is a huge concern. You do not want to do more harm than the invasive species you're trying to control. So we're currently dialing in concentrations and timing and exposure durations, all those details uh, with ongoing research this summer and next summer, um, hopefully to get to the point where we have some tools at our disposal. Next slide. But it's 2022, broad spectrum pesticides aren't, don't have to be the only tool in the toolbox. There are genetic technologies where we can manipulate genomes or interfere with the genetic process to get animals or plants to do whatever it is we want them to do. Um, we had a huge breakthrough a couple of years ago and we recently made the cover of this prestigious journal called G3 um, for sequencing the zebra mussel genome. The team of scientists that put this together um, ought to be commended. It was a huge effort and a major scientific accomplishment. Next slide. Where this goes is you can, with this genome mapped out now, we can target with high precision parts of that genome to make these muscles do what we want them to do. So for example, a technology called RNA interference is currently being tested in the lab um, to disrupt the process of abyssal thread formation. 
Bissell threads are the little threads that they use to attach to hard surfaces. If they can't develop those Bissell threads, they can't attach, they'll settle to the bottom and they'll die. No freshwater mussel has this. It would be highly selective and specific to the zebra wow. mussel. They're also pursuing um, genes, interfering with genes that form the shells or the temperature tolerance. There's lots of ways we can interfere and that's all being experimented with right now in the lab. Next slide. Now we know this the idea of genetic modification is um, uh, a bit sci-fi and this is still years out, but we want to be sure that we're moving the social science along with the technical science. Understanding the attitudes, perceptions, the ethics of modifying genomes and all of that that comes with it is important to do. So we're working closely um, with the federal and state regulators. Um, we're engaging with the tribal communities to understand um, their concerns so we can build this research in a way that um, is safe and effective and accommodates the real world. Next slide. Another species of, so shifting gears a little bit here, another species of local relevance, I think are, um, it's going to become increasingly important up there. Already a couple of lakes in Itasca County that have starry stonewort. Um, this is technically a macroalgae, first confirmed to be in Minnesota in 2015. It has since spread to 15, 16 different lakes in the state. At least been confirmed in 15 to 16 different lakes. Next slide. We've really ramped up research on the species to really like, some of the basic questions of where could it survive? How does it move around? How can we manage it? This basic stuff is a seemingly straightforward questions. The science hasn't been done. Um, and what had been done wasn't necessarily applicable here in Minnesota. Um, so we've done a lot of suitability models. Um, most of the models that we have run suggest that Minnesota's may be on the fringe of its suitable range, but nevertheless, there are some lakes that are um, clearly at risk. The species has established in multiple locations and doing quite well. Um, where these models uh, overlap with um, some predictability um, overlaps really well with where the current invasion status is. Next slide. Um, asking the question of how it could spread, there's a big concern, and you may have heard talk of quarantining lakes, essentially shutting lakes down to prevent the spread early in the invasion. Um, so we ran these desiccation trials, straightforward trials, um, but it was really important information. And as you can see from these data here that I'm presenting in a really simple form, um, small fragments on a boat trailer will be viable for about two hours. The bubbles, that reproductive structure, um, essentially like the potato of the starry stonewort, um, there can be viable out of water for about four hours. And large clumps that can retain some moisture on the inside um, for a couple of days may be viable. So this suggests that reasonable prevention efforts, if you are doing that cleaning and drying at the boat ramp and um, slowing sort of the potential spread from source locations, um, is possibly achievable. But there is um, concern, of course, for non-compliance and when inspectors aren't there. Um, in areas of a boat that may retain moisture could be um, extend these viability times. Next slide. So thinking about control efforts, what can we use to treat them? Um, I'll just skip to the punchline on these next couple of slides. Um, in the lab with a variety of chemicals, all we can really hope to achieve is some reduction in biomass. It doesn't eradicate the macroalgae and it does not really do anything to those bulbs, the, essentially the seeds of the plant. Um, and that's important to understand when you're considering management tools out in the field. So we really don't have a lot at our disposal. Next slide. So how does this played out? With, uh, paper was, um, I think it's nearing submission or maybe it was, has been submitted. Um, this research team looked at a meta-analysis of all the control attempts that have been done um, in three different states, in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Indiana. Uh, 35 different lakes have been monitoring the population over time. Um, a couple hundred point intercept surveys, um, a couple hundred uh, treatment attempts. And you start to put all this together and you start to see patterns emerge. 
And what they see is within a lake that has starry stonewort, um, the occurrence of the starry stonewort is going up over time in all lakes, even those that have been subjected to treatments. And within the treated areas, there really isn't a big change, uh, no significant difference in the abundance of the macroalgae in those treated areas. So punchline there, treatments really aren't being effective. When you zoom in on a couple of case studies that they looked at, there may be some glimmers of hope. There are, uh, in Lake Coronas, for example, um, the treatment there has shown effectiveness for reducing biomass for nuisance control. It's not getting rid of it. It's still spreading in that lake, but boats can navigate. So there's some hope for some applications of uh, this uh, approach. And in Grand Lake, where they found this plant um, very early in the infestation, um, that hand removal, so snorkeling and scuba diving and pulling up a hand has been very effective. And I've got my fingers crossed that one of these years coming up, they'll put the eradication word on that one and um, show some success for management. What these last couple of slides emphasized to me is that prevention is really, really important. We do not have tools once it becomes established like we have for some other plants. And if it does show up, finding it early is critical to have any hope of doing anything about it. And those two points are a nice segue into the second part of this talk of what you can do. So next slide, Chris. So there's a lot going on out there, a lot of species, a lot of lakes. Um, it's overwhelming and I acknowledge the, that feeling uh, myself too, but uh, we have to, I, I think there are opportunities for us to do things that can really make a difference. And I'm gonna give you a couple examples here framed as how the research that we're doing can inform what you can do out there in the field to really make a difference. So next slide. And the first one, the first example I'll give you is with spiny water flea. Now this one isn't far from my task at Cowan either. There's about 50 lakes or so in the state that currently have spiny water fleas. This is a little zooplankton that you'll hear more about it in the video that will play. Um, but it's on your doorstep and uh, you'll see why it matters here in just a second. Next slide, Chris. Spiny water fleas are small invasive zooplankton. They invaded Lake Superior and they're invading our inland lakes. And we worry about that because research has shown that they disrupt the food web. They eat the food that small fish need to eat. And that means that in lakes with spiny water fleas, we found that the walleye are smaller and fewer of them and slower growing. So we want to do research to try to figure out why spiny water fleas are so easily spread. Because fish, small fish, can't use spiny water flea as an alternative resource because of that long tail spine, it creates kind of an energy and nutrient sink in the food chain. And research is showing that that is having indirect sort of cascading effects up the food chain. And people and their recreational activities are implicated as one of the major ways in which spiny water flea is being moved from, from lake to lake. And this project is all about trying to identify what types of recreational gear, in particular fishing gear, might be most susceptible to ensnaring spiny water flea. We outfitted two of our boats to be able to troll fishing line like anglers do. I and mean, what we found is that the more spiny water fleas there are in the lake, the more likely they are to end up on your gear. But fishing line is what really entangles spiny water flea. And so we need people to remember to like wipe down their fishing line when they leave the lake. The most important thing, of course, is drain all your water. They can stay alive in the water in your bait bucket, your live well, the bottom of the boat. So drain your water and then wipe down your fishing line and get those guys off there. And then maybe dry out your bait bucket and your live well. We don't currently have any method, whether it's biological or, or physical, for example, or chemical, to eradicate spiny water flea, short of draining the entire lake. So the best approach to fighting this invasive species is to, to contain its uh, current range and to prevent future spread. Not often 
a place that you hear about as a, a prevention strategy here, the clean drain dry. And it's usually people looking at their trailer and the sides of their boat and the water that's in it. But that recreational equipment is um, really important to keep an eye on. And um, on the website, on this website, uh, stopspiny.org, or you can find it through the Maserk website, um, has a link or has a, this video that plays if you want to see the, the researchers talking themselves. So what can you do? The, the punchline that they would give you is that fishermen, anglers out there um, ought to be keeping an eye on their fishing gear as they move between lakes. Um, next slide. On this stopspiny.org website, um, there are a ton of resources. So even if you aren't going to spiny water flea infested waters, let's say you're part of a lake association or a conservation group um, or a task of waters, you guys can send this information out to people who care about these issues and who may themselves be going to these places and coming into a task of county. Um, we have these Swedish dish claws. I, they look like this. Um, we have uh, these and the local partners are distributing them. We have videos that you can share with your folks. There are fact sheets. Um, we created a special flyer for the Boundary Waters because that's a high risk area. There's graphics and things that you can share on social media. We've essentially packaged all of this in ways that are easily distributable. Um, this is a species, again, that's on your doorstep, and it would be great for folks out there to be aware that it exists and how to identify it. Um, like some of these other problematic species, there are no tools for management. This is purely a prevention game right now. And we've tried to make that as easy as possible um, based on the research that informs these recommendations. Next slide. All right, so another uh, one here that is really important to keep in mind is bait fish. Uh, a lot of research by us and by others suggests that bait fish can serve as a pathway for spread. So live bait fish are immensely popular among Minnesota anglers. We have over a million people that get a fishing license and go out on the water every year, 70% or so of which bring live bait fish with them and potentially release them into the water. Although live bait fish release is illegal in the state, we know that not all anglers follow the rules and dispose of their live bait fish on land. Our study found that about one in five anglers release their live bait fish into the water. So while bait fish are an important cultural and economic aspect of many Minnesotans' lives, they also present a risk for the spread of fish pathogens and invasive species that could be hitching a ride with those bait fish when they're released into the water. So the purpose of our project is to understand the frequency of those behaviors that allow those diseases to spread along this pathway and then identify the why or understand the causes for why anglers do what they do, why they release their bait fish and what we could do to reduce that risk and preserve important fishing and bait industries while also protecting valuable Minnesota resources. So right now we're at a really exciting stage where we've wrapped up what I consider part one of the project, which is just quantifying that risk. That involves understanding which pathogens are most likely to be risky, understanding what behaviors actually are occurring on the landscape, what are anglers doing that could contribute to the risk of fish pathogen spread. And now we're at a point where we just got all this new data in from our latest angler survey, and that will start to really dive into the why of why anglers are actually releasing their live bait fish. So that in includes a lot of social and psychologically focused questions. So this is a contentious issue and I would love to see members of the public, including the angling community, as well as the bait fish industry, the Department of Natural Resources, and all people come together and recognize that we all want the same thing. We want clean water, we want healthy fish, we want equitable access to vibrant fisheries and resources in Minnesota. So if we can recognize that there's a win-win-win situation available to us here, I think we can come together and find solutions that protect our natural resources while also supporting the vital bait and fishing industries that we have here in Minnesota. bait fish into the lake is illegal in Minnesota, but about 20% of anglers will do that. Even though it's against the law, they are reporting to us through our surveys that they're releasing these fish into the environment. So we've been doing a lot on how um, understanding the, the social psychological drivers of why they do that 
and who does that exactly so we can target intervention in strategic ways. What types of messaging will they listen to? Um, who should be delivering that message? And in what parts of the state and what demographics should be receiving it? These sort of basic outreach things are really important. But as all of you um, go out, or many of you, I suspect, will be out in the lake next weekend for opener, bringing these minnows with you, I highly encourage you to dispose of those leftover bait on land um, and do not release them into the environment. The research is clear that that introduces risk um, and is against the law. Next slide. All right, so those are some best management practices. And let's say you really wanna get involved. I would direct you towards our AIS detectors program. This is a citizen science effort that we do in partnership with the U of M extension program. Next slide. So we created, oh, sorry, here's, um, if you participate, I just wanted to give a shout out to the team. You'll get to know these folks um, very well if you um, participate in this program. And I uh, expect that there are some AIS detectors in the call today. Um, next slide. So their uh, premier program, the, the main uh, piece of the detectors program is their core course. This builds capacity at the local level um, volunteer capacity to make a difference on your lakes with your lake association in your county, um, your nonprofit. This is trained folks who are committed to the cause and they're getting this training um, from these folks that you saw on the previous slide. Um, there's over 300 AIS detectors now certified in the state. They've contributed thousands of hours when you put that into economic terms. That's over $600,000 of local volunteer impact um, that has been done since this program's inception about five years ago. Next slide. And I wanna um, highlight here that um, thanks to the work of Itasca Waters, in particular Bill Granchies from the SWCD the, in the county, um, you guys are going to have a front row seat here, an opportunity to participate in the AS Detectors core course it's going to be a virtual workshop on June 13th and 14th. It's going to be, from what I understand, free um, to Itasca Waters folks or people that sign up. Um, so reach out to Bill if you're interested. I highly encourage you. This is um, entry level stuff. You'll um, be uh, um, for that local capacity again to make a difference. If you really want to get involved, this is the, the best way to do that um, in your area. And it's going to be free. Next slide. So what can these volunteers really do? We, you know, we got a, some skepticism, to be honest, at the beginning, like, well, what a bunch of, of volunteers, like what sort of difference can they make? Um, I'll give you an example. And Starry Trek is a perfect um, example of the huge impact that people like you can have on their local lakes. So Starry Trek is a once a year event where um, trained folks, uh, they get trained in the morning, they go out during the day to, um, surveil lakes, boat ramps for starry stonewort and other invasive species. Next slide. In the last few years, that group, there's a couple hundred folks that do this across the state, um, more the merrier. So if you're interested, um, stay in touch with Bill and he can get you involved. Um, about 20% of the current starry stonewort infestations have been found by these citizen volunteers. Um, just regular folks out there doing the good work are making a huge difference. Over 50 new invasive species reports across the state. Um, the golden clams, for example, just like groundbreaking stuff that have really changed the mindsets of managers. Nobody would have found it um, until these volunteers came along. And in that case, it was a really cool story with um, a group of homeschool students. These kids found it as part of this program and it was, it was just great. Next slide. And if you want to get um, more on the um, more of the research in depth webinars, the AS Detectors program um, offers a webinar series. They also offer um, advanced trainings for plant ID. They have a new course called AIS 101. Um, it's uh, really creating a um, it's a step up from the core course where they train people to be an informed consumer in a way, an informed shopper. Um, if you're going to do management on your lake, if you're the the invasive species coordinator for your lake association, 
Um, that would be a great course, AIS Management 101, and you can find it on the AIS Detectors website. Next page. Now, there's a, a lot more that you can do, and you probably expected me to say clean, drain, dispose. It's best practice, also the law. Um, do that. It makes a difference. You, we know this from the research. Um, managers tell you they keep reinforcing it. It's important that we remind ourselves and others to do that as they leave the lakes. I encourage you just to be aware of the threats that are out there. Um, participating in talks like this, I'm probably preaching to the choir that you care about these things or want to know more, but there's lots of other ways to, to up your education game and the detectors course can do that. Um, stay active, provide a positive message. Um, the research is clear across disciplines that being positive out there, a, um, that perspective, that approach improves outcomes on many fronts and same is true for AIS management and response. Um, it's a wild world right now and um, I encourage you to be an advocate and support science, like a science-based approach to the work that we're doing and managers are doing. Um, that's essential to moving the ball forward. Um, again, a plug for the Itasca Waters Detectors course that Bill's coordinating. Um, MACERC has a newsletter and social media that I highly encourage you to sign up for on our website. And if you're so inclined, um, we're blessed with immense support from lake associations and foundations and individuals across the state um, with donations. And that really drives a lot of the work that we do and how we can do it and remain nimble and flexible um, through donations. So I'll just put a plug there for that. Next slide. Um, well, that looks like it's it. So thanks everybody. Um, and I hopefully have time for some questions. Well, thanks, Nick. That's great to hear that there's reasons for some optimism. You guys are doing great work. It's really cool. So next, uh, speaking of Bill Granches, let's bring in Bill for the question and answer section. Bill? Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Dr. Phelps. That was uh, very informative. We have a couple of questions here. Um, the first one, uh, well, it's kind of a favorite. What about the ducks? Spread is inevitable. Uh, what do I, what I do doesn't really matter. I mean, what's your answer to that? Yeah, so I get, um, it's asking a lot. So I ended it there with stay positive and optimistic here, but um, there is a reality that I hear from some folks of um, spread is continuing. There'll be another 40, 50 lakes probably this summer that get zebra mussels. And um, what difference can I make as an individual? Um, it's clear that the responsibility in large part lies with the people that are moving around. There's very little evidence um, that wildlife, ducks in particular, have any role, any meaningful role in the spread of invasive species. Um, there's been a couple papers that have looked at it. Um, super short distances are low risk. So long distance movements, not really possible. And when you look at their native ranges, um, these species have coexisted with wildlife forever, and they haven't been jumping out of their native range and invading surrounding areas via the wildlife. It wasn't until people moved around that we really started seeing these problems. Um, so um, hopefully we can dissuade some of that, uh, that misconception, that myth that I hear a fair bit. Agreed. Next question is from Jan. And if you had to pick the biggest AIS threat to Atasca County, which one would it be and why? Mm. Good question. Um, picking least favorites is always as hard as picking favorites for things. Um, I would probably put zebra mussels on the top of the list with starry stone work close behind. Um, with about 300 lakes currently invaded with uh, zebra mussels, it's becoming harder and harder to plug those holes um, to prevent spread from more and more lakes is with, with limited resources. It's just asking too much for managers to be 100% perfect. Um, so the likelihood of invasion with zebra mussels is much higher than some of the other species that we're worried about. Control options, once established, um, are very few, if any that are permittable right now. 
and the impacts to the environment, to sport fishing, to the waters, re-engineering the ecosystem, and the impacts potentially on human health um, can be dramatic. So I put them at the top of the list, yeah. Very good. Um, third question is from Elizabeth. Are lampe, sorry, are lamprey in Lake Superior? Yes, um, lamprey are in Lake Superior. They were, they migrated in when the Welland Canal was created to connect the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, they have caused enormous problems, um, unbelievable impacts over the decades. Um, there are control options right now. There's a lamp per side that they use. The Great Lakes Fishery Commission spends roughly $20 million a year managing, suppressing sea lamprey. Um, it's effectively managed. Um, and what I mean is it's not causing major impacts anymore. They're still there. Um, it's still a management concern, but it's not impacting the system in the ways that it used to. Um, but they are exploring right now genetic biocontrol strategies for that species as well in ways to um, get away from chemical control that they currently have going on and physical barriers that they use quite a bit too. Mm -hmm. I use sea lamprey as an example of, of a positive thing that the research has done and how it's helped fisheries rebound in Superior. Mm -hmm. All right, next question is from Shirley. Are there solutions from industries that are experiencing clogged inlet outlet pipes? Yes, there are tools that are available for industrial applications. They're easier to permit than open water control efforts. Um, they're also usually lower cost because they're more targeted in scope instead of a, a huge lake. Um, so there are um, chemical products, um, copper based, um, there's biological products, um, Zequinox that can be used in some settings. Uh, UV sterilization is being used um, for hydropower. Um, what we're experimenting with right now is this really cool, innovative coating. Um, this, it disrupts the enzyme signaling that happens at the microbial scale. So it's, it's getting a little technical here, but. It's essentially this additive that we can put into paint that prevents biofouling. And that can be painted on. It's not environmentally toxic. So it's not like copper leaching out in some paints that are being used right now. Um, it's more selective to what attaches to the surface. We have these test um, arrays currently deployed in the Mississippi River, in the Superior Harbor, and out on Lake Minnetonka. And it is, there's a significant difference in areas that have been coated with this product than areas that aren't. So in industrial settings, that might be a really promising tool in the future, you essentially just paint on um, a, a coating that they can't attach to. That's really encouraging. Um, next question is from Tom. It's actually two questions, but they fit so well together. How far out is the genome treatment for zebra mussels? Our lake has zebra mussels and everyone on the lake wants to know what we can do. Yeah, um, okay, so the genetic biocontrol, um, technologically speaking, we can do it. Um, we have some uh, research hurdles to overcome on the delivery mechanism of how you get this RNA interference product into the muscle. So how can they take it in and how you incorporate it into an algae or some biopesticide that's delivered to the lake. So the delivery piece is the big question right now. And that's what's going on in the lab on campus as we speak. Um, the next step would be small scale uh, like pond based experiments. And that step if all goes well in the lab, it's probably two to three years out. Moving into the, a real environmental setting is going to require some significant regulatory approvals that, to be honest, aren't mapped out yet. Genetic biocontrol is so new that the regulatory agencies, including the EPA, the FDA, the USDA, um, all these big Fed agencies are weighing in on what that process ought to look like for safe and effective use. 
On top of that, at the local level, the Minnesota DNR needs to weigh in and um, provide some direction on what that process will look like too. So once we get the process, we perform the environmental risk assessments, um, best case scenario. I mean, I'm hesitant to put a date on it, but maybe a decade out where this is something that could be realistically applied, assuming all goes well. Now, this is different, I should point out. Um, this RNAi that I'm talking about is different than a gene drive CRISPR-based inheritable trait. Um, so the regulatory process is likely much easier. It's a lower bar for non-heritable modification. Um, so there's very different types of genetic tools that are being used. Um, RNAi is much further ahead in agricultural applications for egg pests and for human health and things like that. Well, there is hope on the horizon. Uh, next question for you, Dr. Phelps, is from John. After zebra mussels, starry stonewort, and spiny water fleas, what are the next species that may cause problems to our lakes in north central region? Um, all right, so there are a few um, invasive species that are largely driven by um, nutrient loading and warmer water, which it's unclear what sort of impact they might have up north. So those, <laughs> the cold weather might be a benefit in some ways in this, those cold, clear lakes. So things like Eurasian water milfoil and hybrid water milfoil are out there. They're huge problems in the central and southern half of the state, um, less so up north. One in common carp, the same thing. They like shallower, um, warmer, more eutrophic lakes than what you have up there. Um, nevertheless, species where we focus a lot on here at Maserk and maybe a concern in some areas in Itasca County. One species that I'll put on the radar that I didn't mention was non-native Phragmites. That one could definitely live up north. It's a wetland type plant. It's going to grow along the shoreline and in ditches along the road. Um, this is a species that Minnesota didn't really have their hands around um, until just a few years ago. And if you talk to your friends over in you know, the Great Lakes in Michigan and Wisconsin, go down to Nebraska or out in Washington, um, it is a huge problem, but just massive acres and acres and acres of this plant that can grow 15 feet tall and so dense that nothing else will survive. Um, we did a survey a couple of years ago and it's continued on with largely with the volunteer effort and local folks out there looking for it. Um, we've mapped now 900 populations of non-native Phragmites in Minnesota, mostly in the southern half of the state, but there are populations up north um, that do exist. An important fact, though, um, of those 900, the vast majority are very small, very localized populations that are being seeded and um, just at that early stage of invasion. We wrote a report three years ago that outlined the estate management response. How, what would you do? Like what tools would be used? How much would it cost? Who should do the coordination? Just lay it out the management plan. And that good news, like this is one of those success stories is now being implemented and managed by the DNR and in cooperation with local watershed districts, counties, SWCDs. Um, I think roughly half of those populations are being effectively managed. They're snuffing out these hot spots now so they don't continue to spread. But if you see something that looks sketchy, and I wish I had a picture to show you, it's like a, a tall um, grass with a little fluffy end on it, um, really tall. Um, you should report that, send it over to Bill. Bill will get his crew to check it out and we can get it verified through our Phragmites response team. Um, and we can get that on the list for control. That's one that could cause huge problems that if you look at the map right now, you guys are sort of on that, that front of where it exists. It's definitely on our radar here, especially with our control monitoring group when they're doing their lake surveys. Next question is, if our lake gets zebra mussels, what problems will that cause for us to use the lake recreationally? All right, so I'm going to run through a few of the changes that will happen once zebra mussels show up. And this is, um, I'll be generic in the way that I say these because with the caveat that not all lakes respond in the same ways. 
Um, like I said earlier, not all lakes are good walleye lakes and so not all lakes are gonna be good zebra mussel lakes. But in general, what you would expect to see are clear waters. They filter out the base of the food web, the lake will get clearer. The gut reaction is great, clear water, but that's gonna allow plants to grow deeper. It's often going to lead in more frequent and more prolific algae blooms. And those nutrients have to go somewhere. And so you'll see these algae blooms pop up in the summertime. Often um, what we're seeing are more um, toxic forms of cyanobacteria that um, can lead to fish kills and things when the zebra mussels are disrupting that, that base of the food web. Um, some other changes you'll see, you'll see, of course, biofouling on your equipment. So you'll see the shells washing up on the shore, they're sharp. Um, that'll change the way you use the lake and how you have to clean your boat and dock and all that. Um, one thing that's, well, might be new to some of you and the research is just coming out, a student defended her thesis on this topic just a few months ago and the paper's currently being reviewed. Um, but what we can see um, the effects on the sport fish populations can be dramatic. Um, they are making the fish walleye specifically about 15% smaller in lakes that are in that first year of life um, in lakes that are invaded with zebra mussels. Because they're smaller, we're seeing that their survival into that second year is lower in lakes that become invaded. So they're gonna change the way that the walleye and likely perch interact and grow and make it to catchable size. We're also seeing a human health component here. And this was first reported in Lake Michigan and um, for the first time reported in inland lakes here in our recent study, um, it's shifting the way mercury is accumulating in the environment. It's changing the dynamics so much that it's shifting the way mercury is bioaccumulating. It's moving up the food web through walleye and perch in ways that are causing potential human health impacts. So most of the lakes that we looked at, and we looked at about 20 um, invaded lakes, most of those lakes um, before and after, and there's, there's a lot going on here. And so I'm gonna be sort of a high level with this explanation. Um, the, the punchline is mercury concentrations are higher in your walleyes in invaded lakes. Oftentimes pushing it above that sort of safe consumption level by the Minnesota Department of Health. Now that is an important thing that hasn't been reckoned with yet from a management perspective and they're not, um, they're just now having these conversations. This is real time learning and how do we move forward with this information? And does it happen in all lakes and in all lakes in the same way? Um, so long story short, it, zebra mussels will change the environment. They'll change the way that we interact with the environment and it may affect our health in, when we eat the fish that come from these lakes. Mm. Um, long answer, sorry. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's interesting to me how uh, whenever talk of AIS happens, inevitably the vast majority of questions center around zebra mussels, which, which is a good thing, but I think it's important to note that there are many other threats out there as well. Okay. Um, well, good segue to the next question. Um, our, lakes, our lakes have lost all their native snails and now have thousands of big striped snails. Where did they come from and what do they do? Yeah, snails, good question. Um, there, so there is an invasive snail out there, the Band of Mystery snail that, um, was introduced long ago and seems to be moving around. I've heard more reports in the last two or three years of people calling me up and saying, I'm seeing a lot of these dead snails washing up on my beach. I don't know if that's just because people are looking right now and thinking about reporting it or if that's something going on. Um, the science isn't entirely clear on what the impacts are of that species in a lake. They definitely can get um, very abundant and there's of course, questions about carrying capacity and snails are often an intermediate host for different parasites relevant to fish and other animals. Um, so there's a lot of questions around the snails right now that I think deserves mm -hmm. increased attention. Um, and that's one that uh, affects you folks up north and here in the Twin Cities and all the way down south. So um, that's one to keep an eye on. Very good. 
Next question is from Dave Lick. Uh, is there sharing of information between research done in the country on aquatic invasive species or is research not shared? Um, research is definitely shared and um, we work uh, closely and many of our projects have out of state or international collaborators. Um, we work with uh, folks around the world on these issues. Um, not only to ensure, ensure that we're getting the, the brightest minds on these problems, but we're also um, really pushing the science like, right on that cutting edge. Um, so we know what other people are doing. We learn from what's already been done and we venture out into areas that are untouched. Um, we professionally, researchers interact through conferences, through we publish papers, we read papers. Um, there's a you know, the last few years going virtual um, has really, really picked up the information sharing. Um, I've had meetings this week with people all over the world um, talking about invasive species topics. Um, so the, the information is definitely getting out there. A point that I don't think I made earlier that I can maybe say here is the, the research that's going on here at MACERC is unique in its sort of scale and um, like the breadth and the depth of the work going on here is, is pretty special. And we're lucky to have it in Minnesota. There is not an analogous research center like MACERC anywhere in the country. The closest thing is down in Florida and they just focus on aquatic invasive plants. Um, I went to a conference with my peers. Um, it was more of a, a workshop with us, a group from New Zealand, South Africa, Toronto, and Cornell. And that was really the extent of invasive species centers in the world. Um, so we're definitely a leader in this field um, and we're working with everybody who has something to say about it. Okay, we're starting to run short on time here, but hopefully this could be a really quick one. I'm not quite sure how complete of a question it is. What about rusty crayfish? Hmm. Yeah, what about them? So rusty crayfish, <laughs> yeah. Um, they're an invasive species. The sort of prevailing thought right now is that they were introduced in the 60s or 70s as a form of bait from Indiana. They're, they're native elsewhere in the country and they were brought in. Um, there's some old records of or sort of anecdotal reports of um, old, old time bait guys saying that they were brought in for that purpose to your neck of the woods into the um, northeast part of the state. And they've since spread to quite a few different lakes. Um, they can cause environmental harm. Um, they can get very abundant. I've been scuba diving out on Leech Lake, and then there's parts of that lake where the bottom just moves with rusty crayfish. It's incredible. Um, and that changes the, um, the food web. I catch a walleye, it's got 10 little crayfish in its belly. And that's a very different ecosystem than it was prior to invasion. Mm -hmm. Now the negative impacts, that's a question and quantifying those negative impacts um, hasn't been done, not fully anyways. There's still some outstanding questions on um, when and how it, it will disrupt the lake in ways that are a problem. So it's out there, don't spread crayfish around. Um, still learning a lot about that species. Okay, that's all we have time for right now. Dr. Phelps, thank you very much. Dr. Phelps talked about this, but through uh, grants uh, with Atasca Waters, we do have a free, free to people, um, this AIS detectors course. It's 100% online. Um, so you don't have any uh, pandemic problems to worry about there. There is no obligation to uh, put in volunteer hours, although we love it when you do. It's a fantastic course for general knowledge. I've taken it myself. Um, I, I highly recommend it. So you can scan this QR code you see on the screen here, or you can just go to ataskawaters.org and on their website, um, uh, there's, there are links there. So this is through Atasca Waters from grants, uh, um, through the Blandin Foundation, and uh, I'm sure I'm gonna forget the other ones there, but uh, multiple grants on this one. Um, we still have about 15 spots available for that, and that's open to anybody. Uh, Atasca County, people that are near Atasca County, 
uh, people that care about water. So I highly encourage everybody to take this course on uh, the, the AIS detector course. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. All right, Bill. Thank you. And uh, that com uh, concludes our program for today. I hope you enjoyed the second in the Tasca Waters Practical Water Wisdom Series. Many more to come. At Tasca Waters really thanks Dr. Nick Phelps for today's program. We thank Bill Granches for hosting the Q&A portion. And thanks to Atasca Waters board members, Stephanie Kessler and Jan Sandberg for handling all the background work. Most importantly, we thank you for having the interest in clean water and taking the time to be here today. Big tip of the hat goes to the Atasca Waters Education Committee and its partners for all they've done to reduce, to produce today's program, as well as all those to follow this year. Today's program was recorded and will soon be available on our website, atascawaters.org. We will be emailing you soon an evaluation. We hope that you use it to give Atasca Waters the feedback it needs to make these programs even better. Our next live program will be at noon on June 2nd, entitled Protecting Our Waters with Good Systems. The speaker will be Dr. Sarah Hager, a researcher and instructor at the on-site sewage treatment program in the Water Resources Center at the U of M. You can sign up now by going to our website at taskwaters.org. I'm Brian Whittemore. Thank you and see you on June 2nd.